Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Aubrey Reeves, CEO of Business and Arts. Before we begin, I'd first like to take a moment to acknowledge that I am a white settler speaking to you from Toronto. I have the honor to be a guest on the traditional lands and waters of the Petun and Wendat peoples and the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee Confederacies, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, as well as many other Indigenous nations, some of whose names are no longer remembered. By saying the names of its original keepers, we remember that this territory continues to be subject to the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacies and Three Fire Confederacy of the Anishinaabe to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We acknowledge all who came before us and have traveled the lands and waters of this territory, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work, to live, and to meet on these lands. So welcome to everyone to today's conversation about restructuring arts organizational models and business life cycles, which is co-presented by Work and Culture. We're joined by four arts leaders who will share their experiences about mergers, closures, and strategic partnerships. As we're living through a time of great volatility and unpredictability, some of these approaches may help organizations be more adaptive to rapid change. Through the discussion, I hope that we as a sector can move away from a scarcity mindset, instead see the opportunities within partnerships, collaboration, and shared resources. We'll get started in a moment, but just a few housekeeping items first. At the end of the session, there will be an open question and answer period, which I will be moderating. Only the presenters and moderators will have our microphones on today. So please submit your questions in the Q&A box early and vote for the ones you think are most relevant. The session is scheduled for one hour and 15 minutes. We are also happy to have ASL interpreters, Dean and Rogue from Toronto Sign Language Interpreter Service with us here today. And finally, I'd like to say thank you to the Speaker Series presenting partner, Power Corporation of Canada for your continued support of this series that brings us all together. And now to introduce our speakers. Brian Lovner is playing the lead role of moderator today, but I hope we also get to hear some of his own opinions on today's topic. Brian is an executive leader, consultant, and producer with over 20 years of experience. In 2018, he founded BLVE and has since worked with numerous arts nonprofits, both in Chicago and Toronto, to reimagine their operations and expand their impact. Prior to BLVE, Brian was the managing producer of The Second City from 2015 to 2017, managing all theatrical productions in the US and Canada with a yearly budget of over 12 million. And he also previously served as managing director of Chicago's Dramatists. As a fundraiser, Brian has raised over 5 million for organizations and productions in the last 10 years. In addition, Brian successfully pitched the MacArthur Foundation, uh, ending in the creation of a $750,000 program to provide cash flow loans to arts organizations during the 2008 recession. Brian has also produced over 150 theatrical productions with companies such as the Kennedy Center, the Lyric Opera of Chicago, the Hola Playhouse, and Woolly Mammoth Theater. Further, his work as a consultant has been focused on life cycle changes and assisting nonprofits in transformational processes. Joining Brian today is Young Suk Ryu, who goes by JS. JS is the inaugural president and CEO of the National Access Arts Center, NAC for short, after serving as CEO of the organization formerly known as the Indefinite Arts Center since 2017. Under his leadership, the NAC has grown to become Canada's largest disability arts organization, more than doubling in size and actively showcasing Canadian artists with disabilities on the global stage. In February 2021, he unveiled plans to construct North America's first multidisciplinary accessible arts hub, beginning with the revitalization of the old Scouts Hall in central Calgary that will house the NAC's visual arts studios made possible by a multi-million dollar investment from the city of Calgary. Prior to his work with NAC, JS held several senior level roles across a variety of sectors, including at the BAMP Center um, at the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, with the Alberta Medical Association, and he was also principal speechwriter to His Excellency Ko Ishikawa 
ambassador of Japan. In 2017, JS was named one of five fellows from Canada, one in 50 globally, to participate in the Salzburg Global Seminar Forum for Young Cultural Innovators. He was named one of Calgary's top 40 under 40 by Avenue Magazine in 2019. And JS also serves on numerous boards, including the CCVO, the Rocky View County um, FCSS Board, Creative Calgary, the Health Coalition of Alberta, the Banff Centre Corporation, the Korean Canadian Association of Ottawa, and the Canadian Mountain Arts Foundation. We're also joined today by Melissa Tuplin. Melissa has been a member of the Community Investment Team at Calgary Arts Development since 2014, most recently as Community Investment Capacity Manager before becoming Director, Community Investments and Impacts very recently in 2022. She's interested in adaptive and emerging practices in program design that are informed by sector-centered research and impact measurement. Her focus is on the development of grant investment programs that are relational, relevant, and rooted in equity, diversity, inclusion, reconciliation, and accessibility. Melissa holds a BFA from Concordia University with a double major in contemporary dance and theological studies, and she completed the Raza Executive Arts a leadership program in 2019. And last but not least, I would like to introduce our final speaker for today, Peggy Baker. Peggy is one of Canada's most celebrated and influential dance artists. A vivid present, uh, presence in contemporary dance since 1973, she's performed internationally with um, Lara Lub uh, Lubovich, Mark Morris, Mikhail Baryshnikov's White Oak Dance Project, uh, and many, many others, including Frontier Dance Creation and James Cadelka, Dance Makers and Toronto Dance Theatre. She established the Peggy Baker Dance Projects in Toronto in 1990, and for the first 20 years, dedicated herself to solo performance, winning praise for the eloquence and depth of her dancing and accolades for her collaborative partnerships with choreographers, directors, musicians, and designers. Since 2010, her choreography has focused on works for small ensemble. Over its 32 years history, Peggy Baker Dance Project has, has been presented at major festivals and dance centers across Canada and the US, as well as Mexico, Belgium, the Netherlands, Denmark, Korea, and Japan. Beyond the stage, Peggy has premiered five all night choreographic events for Toronto Mise Blanche and situated three hour long choreographic installations in public spaces and galleries across Canada and presented the film work, Her Body as Words, on media screens in Toronto's Young Dundas Square. Under the banner of the Choreogra Choreographer's Trust, she has published a series of booklets and DVDs that document six of her landmark solos, and she's the subject of a book by Carol Anderson called Unfold, um, a Portrait of Peggy Baker, published by Dance Collection Danse. Her many honors include the Order of Canada, the Carson Prize, the Premier's Award, the Governor General's Award, honorary doctorates from York and the University of Calgary, um, the George Luscombe Award for Mentorship, the School of Toronto Dance Theatre's Catherine Ash Award, six Doras, and the Silver Ticket. Finally, she's also an artist in residence at Canada's National Ballet School. So with that, um, I welcome our guests and our moderator, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you uh, very much, Aubrey, uh, for that. And thank you for the opportunity from uh, Business Arts to uh, discuss these very, very important issues. As Aubrey said, uh, for the last few years, I have been focused on helping nonprofits make difficult organizational decisions in service to their communities. This discussion is essential to reimagining uh, our cultural ecology in the near future. As, as we begin re-emerging uh, for the second time now from pandemic lockdowns, it is really necessary for us to elevate the discussion of organizational life cycle from the fringe to the mainstream. The needs of arts and culture organizations are changing and having more options and more models for the future are essential. Organizational transformation should be about service to the community. How can we transform our organizations to serve our communities more effectively? By normalizing the process of transformation, by seeing that closure is not failure, that merger is not failure, can bring about significant shifts in the future path of our cultural ecology. Today, 
we are blessed to have wonderful representatives of organizations that are engaged in these transitions head on and a funder who has taken the lead to help normalize these concepts for their clients. CADA, Calgary Arts Development, was the first organization to build a funding program centered around organizational structural transformation. Full disclosure, I am currently engaged with CADA at building a case study of this program. This program was followed closely by programs in Edmonton and now the CAT Fund in Toronto, which was funded by Metcalf, the City of Toronto and the Canada Council. Let's get started. I'm excited to hear the voices of these three panelists. Peggy, JS, Melissa, thank you so much for being here. Peggy, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, Peggy, can you tell us in short form the current trajectory of Peggy Baker Dance Projects? What are your plans for the future? Uh, certainly, hello, it's it's really beautiful to be here. Well, you heard my, my little overview of a biography, so you know I've been in the form for almost 50 years as a professional dancer. Uh, I left work in companies um, in my late 30s, thinking that I would probably finish dancing in my early 40s. And it turned into the really the biggest part of my career. Um, I went from doing solo work to creating work on ensembles uh, about 12 years ago. And just before COVID hit, I, um, I was confronted <laughs> in my work with um, responses to my creative process and the subject matter for my work that was really quite shocking to me. And I, I realized there's something going on here that I, I don't understand around politics of identity and how those come into play and dance. And so right just as COVID hit, I was in the middle of a, of a project that had a lot of um, complications for me around my process. And a couple of months into COVID, really I can say as a direct response to the murder of George Floyd, I reached out to an organization in Toronto, CIPAMO, Cultural Pluralism in the Arts, um, to interrogate myself <laughs> around embedded uh, practices and just whatever was underlying my work as a white person that I was not conscious of that had led me to, into this sort of confrontational moment with fellow artists in my community. And this interrogation was, um, I could say on a certain level, it was personally dismantling for me. <laughs> to look at myself from a completely different point of view as a person who had with the greatest of ease moved into a life in the arts um, and did not understand that my form was embedded with values that are the product of um, European and settler thought, thinking and, and process. And so I decided in fact, that fall, in so October of 2020, I decided that so deep into my dance life, so much needed to change in my, in my community. I decided that the very most um, productive thing I could do would be to finish up my own work and create room, <clears throat> pardon me, in my community for voices that have not had the space and the resources to grow. So um, I'm in the, now I'm in the final almost year. That, that was the fall of 2020. And we set a forecast for finishing everything by June, 2023. Um, and I can go into the details around that, but um, that's where I'm at now is I'm, I'm looking toward this last, pretty much last season of my company. Thank you, Peggy. That's, you know, these are extremely difficult decisions and conversations to have. And, and I wanna thank you for being so upfront and frank about uh, the process that led you to this. Um, JS, 
Can you tell us uh, in, in short form about the process of merging and amalgamating with two other arts organizations in Alberta? Sure, thanks for this opportunity. Um, I think our journey began in 2017 uh, when I joined this organization that was uh, operating under a different name. And one of the incredible steps that our organization had taken was to reimagine our future as an organization where in the past we had operated and had been seen as much more of a social service or a day program for artists living primarily with developmental disabilities. We chose in 2017 to completely shift and pivot towards seeing ourselves and designing programs around the notion that we are a bona fide arts organization serving bona fide artists. And I can go into that in more detail later as well. With that, uh, the strategic plan that we had unveiled um, also indicated ambitions around becoming a multidisciplinary um, arts training and creation hub for Canadian artists living with developmental or physical disabilities. And so that was set as a, as a benchmark that we all wanted to aspire to be as an organization. Fast forward a little bit to 2020, um, we uh, had worked fairly closely with two sister disability arts organizations based in Calgary. One was known as Artistic Expressions. That was an organization that had worked primarily with, the, with our organization in supporting a small community of artists with physical or acquired disabilities. And the other was uh, Momo Movement. Some of your our viewers might know Momo Movement, um, one of the most longstanding uh, disability dance companies based in Calgary. And in 2020, um, if conversations leading up to 2020 certainly came much more, became much more accelerated when it was very clear that um, primarily due to COVID, um, and especially in Alberta, given that so many smaller arts organizations rely fairly heavily on gaming revenue. And at that point in time, gaming, uh, the gaming sector had taken a pause because of COVID, um, that these two organizations looked at themselves and asked the very difficult question around whether sustainability was even a possibility um, during and post COVID. And I commend uh, both the boards and the, the teams at both organizations who I think were courageous enough to uh, share those concerns with us um, at that point in time, we had grown fairly significantly as an organization and started to build out infrastructure, whether that's marketing, fundraising, um, and artist support. And, and these two organizations looked at that and said, can we benefit from not operating in our own, you know, two and a half staff, one and a half staff models, but actually embed our program ambitions into the kind of established and growing infrastructure that could be afforded by um, by joining forces with the Indefinite Arts Society. And so uh, it was a year long process with both organizations happening concurrently. Um, so uh, lawyers and financial analysts made a, a bit of money during that process because they are uh, fairly important to analyze um, the, that process from both the legal governance and finance perspective. And uh, in November of 2020, we unveiled that we had completed, um, you know, we use the word merger fairly liberally here, um, but in, in the case of, from the perspective of CRA, it was simply the winding down of those two companies and the transferring of those assets with an agreement in place that we would inherit that infrastructure and respect um, the staff that were part of those organizations and the artists supported through those organizations in a loosely defined merger process. Um, and that, uh, and that at that point we unveiled ourselves with a new brand as the National Access Art Center, positioning ourselves as the country's first multidisciplinary disability arts organization. And since that point in time, I can tell you that across all of our new communities that we're supporting, including artists with physical and acquired disabilities and our new performing arts programs, we are really shaking up the arts and culture ecosystem both locally within Canada, but also around the world, including our most recent uh, multidisciplinary production at COP26 in uh, Scotland. Wonderful, thank you, JS. As if uh, merging or amalgamating with one organization weren't difficult enough, um, uh, moving to two organizations uh, at the same time. Uh, congratulations and huzzah to you for making it through that process. Um, hi, Melissa. Um, 
as a as an arts and culture as arts and culture organizations struggle with uh, what's next uh, coming out of the pandemic, uh, how is CADA prepared to serve and support organizations in transition? Yes, uh, thanks, Brian, and and uh, thank you to JS and Peggy. Um, Calgary Arts Development as a funding agency has endeavored over the past years to begin uh, considering what it looks like to shift our approach to grant making from one of transaction to one of relationship. And being in relationship with the communities that we serve means being prepared to come alongside them regardless of circumstance. And the pandemic was such an excellent test of that principle that the organizational models and the funding structures that we have uh, inherited um, exist on the conceit of perpetuity, which I think we see is uh, not only unsustainable, but as Peggy has spoken to, um, doesn't create room for the richness of, of new voices um, and the unpacking of, of the ways in which these organizational models and funding models actually created a lot of the conditions that were perpetuated and entrenched by the pandemic. A lot of these challenges are not caused by the pandemic, um, but it really created this kind of explosion of uh, recognition that um, the, <laughs> the, the glass was very thin. And so as we look ahead to what recovery might mean, acknowledging that the impact of the past two years are going to play out over three, five, a, a decade from now, um, as a funder, our responsibility is to really take the time to consider and acknowledge our power in the system and what it means to be responsible to a public, what it means to be accountable to the dollars that we're stewarding and to create the conditions for organizations to have these conversations, to um, work very, very hard to unravel uh, and, and deeply investigate the power distance that exists between a funder and an organization to be able to have a frank and honest and open conversation um, that isn't couched in fear. Uh, Brian, you had said something really interesting to me in a conversation that we had about the organization structural change program. Uh, of, is this a relationship of trust or is this a relationship of necessity? And that's really stuck with me as we imagine what a funding program looks like in the future. So uh, that's the long answer. The short answer is this stuff is expensive. It takes time. We've been having these conversations around supporting life cycle. How do we help organizations sunset? Why don't you partner with those guys over there? Um, what about shared resources? It's time for us to step up and offer the support for that directly, to be very intentional about it um, in a way that again, uh, creates the opportunity for dialogue and shared learning and shared understanding as we step into a future that um, none of us can imagine, but I hope we're all really excited by. Thanks so much, Melissa. Yeah, funders play a huge part in uh, life cycle transformation and, and really in normalizing these, uh, these kinds of transformations uh, and helping uh, the public and uh, organizations understand that these are normal uh, for organizations to make these kinds of shifts and changes. Uh, the next question is for JS and for Peggy. Um, let's talk about the steps that you took in your transformations, you know, in your transitions. Um, what were the first steps that you took? How did you build internal support um, for these difficult uh, transformations that needed to happen? Uh, whoever would like to start. Yeah, sure. I'll go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, JS. Um, well, I made this decision, I'm going to say, primarily on my own, first of all. I, I never had a succession plan for my company. I always knew my company is going to fold because I really started as an independent artist. I only incorporated six years into my solo work when I realized it was going to be a more stable structure for me because I had a lot of touring. Um, I first went to my manager 
I shared this with my um, associate artist. I went to the chairman of my board. And then I needed to go and have, after those first really big conversations, I needed to speak in person with about, I'm going to guess about 25 people who were extremely close to me artistically that I wanted to be able to tell this to individually. Needed to have a special meeting with my board to let all of those people know. I needed to meet with in, individually with the uh, Canada Council and the Toronto Arts Council and the Ontario Arts Council and the Metcalf Foundation. And I did nothing but communicate this decision uh, for about four months. And then finally, I brought together everybody who was currently working with me and we had a massive Zoom to talk about what was happening in the future. And I needed to let all of those people know in real time and space. And it was really, I'm going to say, heavy. It was so many people. It changed so many people's lives <laughs> that were working with me. Um, and then we made a public announcement. And that announcement went out the day after I had shared this information with my company. So that was, yeah, about four to six months of just pure communication Thank because you. the implications. Yeah. And Brian, for us, um, I think the most important thing, and, and similarly, I think to um, what Peggy had shared earlier, although from a perhaps a different perspective, um, is this, um, is this acknowledgement amongst all parties involved, even before we walk down this process of, are we doing this for the right reason? And what is that reason? And in our case, amongst the three organizations, it was very clear, will this lead to better supports and services and a better platform to support artists living with disabilities? And if that answer is yes, let's take the next step forward. For us, it was a very, intentional step-by-step -step process. Um, it would not have happened, I will just make a special shout out to the McConnell Foundation in our case that had funded um, a fairly generous process um, where we would be able to hire a third party consultant because it's also very important, I think, for a third party to come in and allow us to have sort of a neutral ground to speak on with um, and because uh, as all of us and your viewers will will know and can appreciate, you know, when we're talking about winding operations down, dealing with assets, um, and, and we 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 think back on all the volunteers, all the the the, the donor relationships, all of the do, the fundraising events, the incredible hard work that had. To had to be put in to be able to establish the infrastructure of these other organizations. Um, and so to have a third party continue to remind us that we're walking on this path, not to downplay the legacy of those two organizations and not to think of this as a failure, but very much so a process where all parties involved have only one singular purpose in mind, which is to, um, you know, develop a model. And at that point in time, I'll, I'll say it wasn't a, a, a given that we would be amalgamating together, right? That we would be merging together, that these organizations would be winding down their organizations. But it was that initial first step. When the third party consultant came on board when, and, and started facilitating conversations, not only among staff, but also at the board levels, um, th th having that grounded conversation, that, got, that grounded perspective allowed us to explore the various ways in which we could come together. And we had a number of different options on the table, including amalgamation slash mergers, or even just more strategic partnerships. But the more we continued down that path with that question in mind, it became clear to all involved that um, a, a formalized uh, merger would be the most ideal in that process. And again, this, is, this was a 12 to 15 month process that I'm nailing down into three minutes. But in that process, um, we had uh, financial consultants, as well as legal consultants to be able to assist in analyzing financial statements, assets, um, and also legal to ensure that uh, there was complete 
adherence to um, CRA regulations, uh, that we understood the step-by-step -step process in which an organization would either merge or dissolve or amalgamate. A again, with CRA, there's various different definitions around the various ways organizations can come together. Um, but but um, all of that to say, uh, I can't emphasize enough. Uh, and I can't also emphasize uh, the incredible courage that it took the boards, the volunteers, the stakeholders of those other two organizations to try and move away from everything that they had sacrificed to build those organizations and to keep that singular focus on uh, what would be best for their participating artists. Uh, and that helped um, accelerate a, a process. Uh, and I would say if it wasn't for that, we'd still be having a conversation with those organizations, but it is with that focus that we were able to, able to successfully conclude that process within a year. Let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the building of internal support, right? You, you've spoken a little bit about the, the logistical side of it, the conversations that had to be had, but some of those had to be emotional conversations. Um, and in, was there pushback uh, on, uh, on either of your cases? You know, Peggy, did, did anyone say, nope, you, you shouldn't retire. Uh, you, it's not time. You know, at JS, you know, what about the organizations you work with? Were there communities that, that, thought maybe the transition wasn't or the amalgamation wasn't a good idea? I don't think in, in our case, there was any inclination that the amalgamation was a bad idea. However, um, in our case, we did go through a fairly hefty round of conversations around, well, how do we protect legacy? Um, and in that, that became, I would say, a, a bit of a prickly point in those conversations. For example, um, would there be an opportunity for the board members of those or other organizations to be a part of the National Access Arts Center board was a very interesting conversation. And, uh, and we all come from different perspectives around governance because we're all at various different stages of evolution as organizations. Um, out of the three organizations, certainly the NAC was far more it advanced in our journey to try and revamp and, and completely evolve organization. Uh, and now we have a completely national board. Um, but in that process, um, you know, sometimes that conversation went to places that was quite uncomfortable because in my, for, to be totally blunt, I'd said, actually, we're not willing to open up that conversation around board makeup right at this moment, right? We as an organization have our own plan as it relates to board development. Should there be an opportunity we can certainly open up the application process, but we're, uh, we're not comfortable um, embedding board members even prior to us understanding what the dynamic of an amalgamated organization would look like. Um, but, but again, the third party consultant allowed us to have that conversation in a safe space. And it allowed the, the consultant to say, look, is board makeup the main ingredient to answering that question about what's best for the artist and try to push everybody back on that singular path of, of looking at decisions based on that question alone. Great. Peggy, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, these were very emotional conversations, but you know, I think just on the totally base level, I was so clear that this was the very best thing to do for my community. I, I just, uh, I'm one of the most senior dance artists uh, in Toronto, probably in the country. Um, and I, I just felt like if I can't step aside, who, who can do that? And if we want things to change, something has to change. So I, I felt very clear about it. And also I've been driven with a sense of purpose for my entire career. And this created so much um, importance around finishing well and in finishing now when we need, when we're, we're in a moment when things need to change and the velocity, like the moment is here. It's the, the moment has arrived and um, so it made me feel really clear and really strong going into it. And most, most of the people who've been around my work, the people who've um, been contributors um, and supported my work 
I think wanted me to be able to finish really well. And my manager said to me at one point, oh boy, if you want to have a good fundraising year, close your company because people step forward actually to, to, I think to honor the work really and to say, we want to help you finish this way. Plus I I needed- Oh, sorry, Peggy. I was just going to say, I think, you know, it needs people, this process needs people like Peggy. Uh, it needs people who actually understand that they have a role to implement this kind of change versus mulling on the past and thinking about legacy. And in the case of our process, um, that was really, you know, that aligned. It, this is a, comp- I think this is a situation where the stars have to align. I do, uh, and I was going to say that, you know, even we had we had some initial conversations a few years, few years before this amalgamation merger process had happened, and we didn't have the right people at the table. We didn't have people like Peggy or myself sort of seeing eye to eye and go, yeah, this is actually, this is, this is the right thing to do. Uh, and let's, 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 acknowledge this as an incredibly courageous and great thing that's happening but to align all those different people and as you said brian to do that with two organizations and two different boards and two different sets of staff that was a challenge but in our case we, we really lucked out that uh, i just wanted to bounce off what you had said peggy just because it was just you know it having that kind of clairvoyance in this conversation was really really important for us well, and you mentioned the word legacy. First of all, in dance, it's a living legacy. It's, it's, it's the people you've taught, it's the people who've seen your performance. It's already, to me, it's already there. Whatever impact I had, that's, that's already been made. It's not something that has to be created after the fact. However, it's really important to do some archiving. And I did not want to leave that to, as a workload for someone else or for someone else to have to try to find the money to do that, for example. So Dance Collection Dance will take my um, materials, but I'm providing everything. I'm spending a huge amount of time right now um, creating digital material around the dances. They're not archival footage. They're conversations really around the body of work that emerged through the company. And we're raising money to give to Dance Collection Dons to support that as a square space um, portal into the foreseeable future. I'm also, we're also able to move, we had money inside the Ontario Arts Foundation and through conversations with them, the, the interest from that endowment is now going to go toward a prize right. at the School of Toronto Dance Theatre. So those kinds of things we need to make right. sure. I don't really have anything else. Sure. You know, I've got some costumes in, yeah. in, in boxes. That's it. Um, JS and Melissa, you're both from the Calgary region. Um, uh, what was your expectation of of funding organizations in the area, JS? And how was CADA able to respond to those needs, Melissa? Whoever wants well, I, I'll just, I think, um, Melissa, tell me if I'm wrong. I, I do believe we actually entered into our uh, merger amalgamation process a bit sooner than CADA came up with the parameters around their program. That being said, I will give a full props to, to CADA that they understood that none of their funding models at the time, their granting programs at the time could fit our request. The, the number one thing and I noticed, I think Kate Cornell has just asked a question around like funders for in Alberta, one of the biggest funders being the gaming um, revenue side of things. These organizations, I think Momo Dance's total budget was about $200,000 annually, of which more than half of, or less, less than slightly less than half of it was through gaming resources right gaming revenues. And in Alberta, you're only allotted one gaming slot per CRA number or per organization number. And so we knew right away that we'd be losing that funding. The same with artistic expressions. We knew that we would lose that funding right away. And for us to approach CADA, um, in our way, in our words, we, we position it as give us some runway. Like we know we can fill that gap, but we can't do it tomorrow. And if you're, you know, if you work with us and you can imagine this being good for the sector, please help us. And Kata turned it around. I would, I can't, I can't even remember. I think it was less than two weeks. I said, absolutely. We'll find the resources to help you. And, uh, and then, and then they unveiled a more formalized structure. 
Yeah, and you know, I, I will, um, I'll give a shout out to my predecessor, uh, Sarah Bateman, who I think really spearheaded this process for us. And I, I, I referenced, you know, we've been having these conversations internally for years. Um, and so in many ways, I think uh, the request that came from uh, JS's situation, uh, I think really emboldened us to move ahead and say, uh, sometimes it's going to be a big old merger like this, and sometimes it'll be something a little bit different. But uh, if the pandemic has emphasized anything, it is the need for a funder to be flexible and responsive. And so then it's not the responsibility of an organization uh, to come forward to us and say, well, like, here's an idea about how you can do this while still meeting your requirements or accountabilities to the city of Calgary. That's our job. It's the job of the organization to have done that work, to come to us and say, we know what we need to do. We have a plan. This is what we need. Um, and so that's something that we're looking at then going forward is, is how do we build in these multiple, multiple entry points? And beyond that, how do we take a really, really hard look at our operating grant model and start to think about how life cycle conversations can actually just be built into that operating grant model, right? We know what the sector needs. They tell us over and over and over, multi-year operating grant. We need that stability. And so if we can build that in and, and find those kind of runways and off ramps, that's the opportunity that we're looking at. And, and I think it's really important that, um, this is a huge leap of faith on the part of everybody to just even start entertaining the thought of closing down an operation, merging, amalgamating, whatever the case is. In the case of uh, the NAAC, huge leap of faith because actually I think we had completed our process and then I went to Kata and said, this is what's going to happen. Do you think you guys can support us? And if they said no, I'm still certain that we could have surfaced um, uh, you know, in a feasible manner, but it was a huge risk. Uh, and I remember throughout the entire year long process of asking ourselves, yeah, what happens if, right? What happens if we can't fulfill that, you know, and, and raise the funding of, of those two bodies um, so that there is no disruption to that work? A lot of organized, and this is the third party consultant in our case, um, by the way, her name is Leslie Tamagi, um, based in Calgary. She can tell you, as she told us, that amalgamating is not necessarily always going to be a cost saving endeavor, right? It's not always going to be, oh, well, because you guys are all coming together, you're going to share all these resources and you'll save tons of money. In fact, in many ways, initially, especially in the initial, I would even say now, now that we're two years in, um, two to three year process, it costs more money. Um, it costs more money to begin to adapt your organization to be able to accommodate and work with the infrastructure that you've inherited. Um, so that that also adds to that leap of faith that you have to take around what 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 happens when you jump, uh, and will you land on hard cement or will there be a funder to help cushion you in that fall? <laughs> That's great, um, <clears throat> Peggy, JS, and Melissa. If you have any input on this as well. Let's talk a little bit about resources for organizations that are trying to make this kind of transformation. Um, you know, uh, JS has mentioned a couple of times a third party consultant, lawyers, accountants. Tell me other um, resources that you found important in this process. And were there books and TED Talks and conversations with leaders? What were other things that helped you cement these decisions that you were making? You know, Brian, I don't have very many examples in my art form of companies finishing well. Usually it's a disaster when a company's closing. And I, and I have colleagues in Toronto who are my generation or a little bit older whose companies collapsed underneath them. And um, I looked towards the Cunningham Foundation uh, in New York, not because I... Um, I'm anywhere close to that status or stature, but he was extremely mindful about how he was finishing up his work. And I found that really inspiring. And the main thing that we're using on a 
more nuts and bolts level is um, that our auditor put together a page and a half of directions for us to follow involuntarily was drawing from our charitable status. And it's all, it's, you know, um, we may end up needing to have a lawyer help us with some things, but it's all, it's all set out there pretty systematically. And I, and I think one of the, like, there's a, a very fiduciary um, process around um, any of the merger amalgamation resolution or dissolution um, processes when it comes to the CRA. And so I uh, highly recommend that you uh, uh, use legal counsel and financial counsel to be able to guide yourself through that. I can't emphasize enough that in the case of the NAAC, um, being armed with some kind of strategic document helps because it helps also ground the conversation around what to what end. I mean, we had, we talked about that one question, what is best for the artist? But, but, you know, we take a step further into that question. It is a very strategic question. It's a strategic plan question. What is, what is future state in five to 10 to 50 years? When you look at it from a perspective of an artist living with a developmental or physical disability, in our case, uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I kind of look back and I laugh because I feel like miraculously a lot of things just kind of were there. As I said, when we unveiled our strategic plan in 2017, that plan had stated that it was going to be very crucial for artists to have one resource to bounce between disciplines and to explore their creativity across you know, a multidisciplinary environment. Having that document gave, I think, our partners a huge sigh of relief because they knew that they would be uh, a recipe to make that happen, but to do it in a vacuum of maybe just more vague questions or do it in a vacuum simply because of necessity, which I think can often happen as well, um, I think is a very dangerous uh, path to walk. Um, you do need, I think, to have that bigger roadmap on top of, like that's even outside of the scope of an amalgamation process. It's where are we headed? And can our, can our conversations and the ideas coming from those conversations feed into that strategic direction uh, of which are, whichever organization might you know, come together? Thank you so much, JS and Peggy, uh, for that input. You know, I think it's very true that, we, uh, that planning is the key um, for these kinds of moves and these, this kind of work. Uh, because it takes um, a significant push from the entire organization to make change like this happen. Um, I'd like to hand it back over to Aubrey now uh, for questions. Great, and yeah, they're starting. We're starting to get quite a few. Um, we're going to start with a, a fairly basic, simple one, but um, maybe a little ch challenging. Why are mergers? so new or unusual in the arts when it happens in the corporate world all the time? Oh, I'm going to jump in on this one first, Aubrey. <laughs> so. so, you know, I, I did a lot of research in this area to try to find out why org arts organizations are the outlier in the nonprofit world when it comes to mergers, when it comes to sunsetting or closing organizations. And what I really found was two things that stood out more than anything else. The first one is one that I think uh, folks probably understand, which is ego. Um, as artists, there is a sense of ego that comes with leadership that perhaps is different than other parts of the charitable sector of the nonprofit sector. So that was the first barrier that I saw that stopped organizations from thinking that they could potentially merge. Secondly, was something I call the fallacy of singularity, which is that many arts organizations have this fallacy that no one can do what they do uh, in any way, shape or form, no matter if there are 50 theater companies in your community, 10 of which are doing Shakespeare, one of those Shakespeare companies may say we are absolutely singular, no one does it the way that we do it. And that, um, that fallacy of singularity sort of pushes those ideas of amalgamation or merger or sunsetting sort of off the table for organizations like that. So I just sort of mm -hmm. start there, please. Anyone else jump in? Well, and Brian, I think it, funding and money has a lot to do with it. As I said, uh, you know, when, when the corporate sector merges, you know, whether it's stock options or whatever, you, know, you see, you see money 
change hands or there's some kind of financial benefit that you see coming out of that kind of a process, it's far more scarce to see that in the nonprofit sector. And I would say it's it's basically impossible to see uh, a financial return on that process in the arts. Uh, so I think funding has a big has a big tie to it. And as long as there aren't more funders like CADA, and I, and I saw Mark's comment about the Canada Council's um, Strategic Innovation Fund, as long as there are not more funders and, and even more corporate philanthropic partners and sponsors who are willing to entertain this idea that they can actually help support whatever comes out of the end of this process, um, I think there's going to be a huge level of anxiety that's going to prevent people from having these courageous conversations, even though they're very much needed. And I'll even say they're incredibly needed, even with the larger arts institutions that are part of our ecosystem right now. Mm -hmm. I'd like to follow up with a, a, a question that hones in on that ego question, um, point uh, that Brian was making. Um, it's for you again, JS is um, this person pointed out that uh, NAC and Momo, there was no artistic leadership in the pl uh, in place at the time. Did this make it easier to contemplate the the uh, merger pro process? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think it would have been more difficult. Certainly, it's an added voice in that conversation. But um, no, is the is the quickest answer to that. I I mean, again, I think there was such a desire from Momo to utilize the infrastructure that was in place at Indefinite Arts at the time, right? At the time, we have, I think we have 17 full-time staff now. At the time, we had about 11 or 12, but even still, that was five times bigger or six times bigger than what Momo had, right? Mm -hmm. And so you had the general manager, book artist appointments, book venues, fundraise, write grants, do this, do that, right? And, you know, and keep the lights on, pay energy bills. Whereas the, the new reality was, well, we have a lot of staff resources that can help that back end. Um, I saw another question. Absolutely. One of the questions that we did ask with Momo was rather than walking down a merger conversation, could we simply start thinking about it from a cost sharing perspective around sharing costs uh, on the back end, whether that's sharing admin, sharing finance officers. So we definitely walked down that path uh, very much so, but in the end, in our process, we chose to take that extra step and just mm -hmm. formally merge the two organizations together. Yeah, and that was the question I was going to next. Um, this one person's asking if we can talk a little bit more about strategic partnerships that don't necessarily lead to mergers, but the benefits of sharing a resources and experience to grow each other's placement in a given region. So I, I thought maybe Melissa, you might have some insights on that one. Yeah, I mean, I, what I will say is uh, when we ran the organization structural change program in 2021 last year, um, I would say the vast majority of the requests to that program were about strategic partnerships. There were very few that were specifically focusing on mergers or we have an idea, we, we are moving ahead with something. Most of them were phase one grants about trying to find ways to explore or uh, formalize strategic partnerships. Um, and so I think that there right now is more of an appetite towards that than uh, organizations necessarily walking down that path of it's going to be a merger or it's going to be us shutting down. It takes the same amount of time, right? Perhaps there's less fees at the end of, uh, you know, to, to manage the, the legal and the finance financial implications, but you still have to take that time to put together these contracts or memorandums of understanding or figure out what that new operating model is. And does that come with logistics like physical space? We need the equipment, who holds those assets? Um, and so it's another thing that we've been talking about in the sector for so long. It's another thing that oftentimes organizations will hear from assessment committees or from grant offices like, why don't, why don't you just partner? It, it takes that time and money. And I think in some ways, the way that we have structured these organizations around a strategic plan model, um, those conversations aren't necessarily built into strategic planning the way that we understand it. Even that is shifting. And so until we can get to that point of kind of building that muscle of asking these questions, um, there's going to be need for these types of specific supports to step in around a very specific type of conversation or innovation. But Melissa, if I can just add a really quick point here, Please. you know, I think part of it, you know, and it happened in our conversations too, again, the funding 
reality makes this very challenging because if you choose to dissolve as an organization or amalgamate as one, you lose your operating grants, you lose your gaming revenue, you lose all the sponsorship revenue that is tied to that particular entity. And so when, when faced with that reality, it becomes, but, but for us in that process, I very much push the idea that that money will follow, right? Don't let money be the deciding factor here, right? Talk, think about doing the right thing first. Is coming together as one organization the best thing possible? Then let's move and, and figure out the rest later, <laughs> even though those are really real problems to be um, addressing. But oftentimes, you know, and I, the, the conversation prior to us in entering into this process was that it's, yeah, it'd be nice, but we're going to lose $150,000 and we're going to lose our casino spot. I don't think that, and, and we're going to, you know, what's going to happen, right? And so I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of organizations then think about strategic partnerships, because then you can still carry on a CRA number. But uh, in our case, we, we really pushed beyond the dollars and cents, even though I know in our sector, that's a very important, very important consideration. Yeah, you may have just answered this question somewhat, but um, this one person's asking you, how did you manage to fulfill the obligations that each organization had around their funds and assets? I think you were just Sort of touching on that a little bit, um, but if there was anything further you wanted to say about fulfilling the obligations that you already had as individual organizations. I think that's a lot easier to do that when the organizations are smaller in scale because there aren't as many stakeholders in that process. But certainly uh, to Melissa's point with Melissa's predecessor, Sarah, we had conversations around, this is what we have chosen to do. And this is why we still think it's aligned with what CADA wants to support, right? And therefore, could we add on, for example, Momo's operating grant that had been received through CADA onto our operating grant? We will then report on the very same metrics that you would have expected from our sister companies, but we, but we want to merge those conversations together. A lot easier when it's a public funder, a lot more difficult, I can imagine, with donors, because not all the donors came came through, um, which was unfortunate, um, because I think there's some there's a sense of brand loyalty that you build between a donor and the organization that they support. Um, that transition uh, remains a big challenge for us, but, uh, but we found a lot of other donors in that process who support a much more multidisciplinary approach to our work. Mm -hmm. So our next question, um, says today one of the biggest challenges for arts organizations is in evolving away from colonial post-war uh, organizational models towards um, truly inclusive models of operation. And obviously this was a big motivation for you, Peggy. Um, is the model of being a not-for-profit with a corporate style board still the right model? I, I think, you know, there is no one size fits all is, is part of the answer, but um, Peggy, maybe you wanna uh, touch on that. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question because I always thought of myself, well, from the time that I started doing my own work as an independent artist, I didn't have a venue. I was, I was uh, making work, responding to invitations to perform. Um, I, but then I could only work at a certain scale without incorporating. And by then I was in my mid forties and I'm, I'm asking myself like, <laughs> Am I acting like I'm, in, you know, in my 20s when I'm in my 40s it, in order to build my work? Um, I had a complicated, you know, there were personal things that went into deciding I had to incorporate also. And I, I will share what one of those was. Um, uh, I had, I, I sustained an injury and had to cancel a tour. And I lost huge amount of money doing that and was responsible for all of that. And I was not incorporated. Mm -hmm. And it was putting my, my husband and his child completely at risk. And I just decided, whoa, this is, <laughs> you know, running my dad's life from, from my shared account, checking account with my husband. This is, this is not a, it's, it's, it's not a way to go. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll jump in and uh, I'll jump in and uh, on this question as well. And and sort of the easy answer is um, is no. The hierarchical model is not the most effective one for arts organizations. I think we we build art in an, in a communal 
way. Uh, and yet we manage art in a hierarchical way. Uh, and that seems antithetical to, to what our reality should be. We should be running our organizations similar to how we function and build our art. Um, and so I, I think as part of this discussion, it is about the need that we have as a community, as an industry, to have more models of, uh, of you know, flattened, if you will, leadership organizations that, that allow us to see that there are other ways we can function to serve our community and serve our art. Uh, I find that the hierarchical model uh, does not tend to be the most effective when trying to manage artists. Um, it, it, it tends towards a decision-making process, process that is, again, antithetical to how we make decisions as a group of artists. Yeah. I, sorry, yeah. and I can just, I'll, I'll tag on just to say that that's where it becomes a me problem, right? Like we, we have a system of funding where we've seen the perpetuation of the nonprofit model because you got to register as a nonprofit to qualify for an operating grant because we're existing on this idea that an organization requires a certain level of governance and that governance looks like a board. Um, and in most cases, especially for smaller companies, and I imagine Peggy, you can speak to this, it's a board made up of people who just wanna support the artist and just wanna support that work. And so we have these layers and layers and layers of the way that their system is perpetuating these models of business, these models of communication or funding or how we work with each other that as a single funder, I can't solve on my own because it doesn't matter if Kata says, well, that's fine. We'll, we'll fund other types of, of business models if my colleagues at the province and at the federal level are also not doing that because then I become a single source funder for an organization. Mm -hmm. um, and then that itself creates the spiral of challenges. And so, this is where we really get to the systems level of conversation where we need to be collaborating together um, to create those conditions to say, can we undo this together? Um, can we really take a step back and think about a different way to be in relationship and actually be leaders within an art sector? Because we know that's, that, that's what we look to artists to do to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, so confidentiality and anonymity are important to leaders as they uh, manage these difficult discussions. Peggy talked a lot about the lengthy months long process of letting people know in her circle. Can um, Melissa and JS, can you enlighten us a little bit on how you communicated the potential changes to your community, internal, external, and otherwise, and how, how you're, sorry, Melissa, how you're seeing it happen through the programs, um, all the organizations involved? Uh, yeah, so I'll just say that a condition of us creating the organization structural change program was that it would be a very confidential process. Now we took that to the extreme of, it was a decision that sat with a single staff member. And you know, within Calgary Arts Development, we're all held to the same confidentiality agreements, but it does start to raise the question of, we are a public funder, we have a responsibility to a much larger community. Um, and so how do you maintain that kind of level of confidentiality and anonymity while still being responsive to uh, the greater needs of the community and the rigor that these processes require? Um, so that's what we're investigating right now is, is how we can kind of increase um, that uh, level of support beyond a single staff member of the organization while still respecting the confidentiality. We took that to the extreme of, for this program, we have said we are not publishing the specific grant results. Um, in the case of um, uh, the National Assets Arts Center, that decision was already being made. We gave the grant, they did their announcement, and then we could. So a lot of times it just means that we need to be in negotiation with with our grantees about what their needs are and i can't tell you how important those principles around confidentiality and discretion were 
utterly emphasized in every single meeting amongst the boards and staff by our third party consultant. Um, you know, and I would recommend again hiring that consultant so that they are friendly reminders to you about, you know, the focus at hand in those conversations. In the case of our um, negotiation process with both organizations, we did start off with a very thorough MOU around the scope of the conversations that were about to happen over the course of the 12 months and a, a very, very a heavily stated confidentiality clause that made it sound like, yes, if you uh, decided to share this outside of our circles, that your head might be chopped off. So we were very, very serious about it. Just because we knew, I mean, and this was actually probably more because of our funders, right? Uh, not to place, not to think that they're the evil monster in the room. And clearly there are good ones and maybe not so good ones, but in, in the case of Kata, they're, they're the good one, right? But in but at that time, with with not knowing where Kata was at, we didn't want to alert them, right? I mean, I we, we wanted them to just you know, stay outside of our conversation for now, because we didn't know where that conversation would land. And the same would be applied to our conversation with our provincial funders or anybody else, or your, our large scale sponsors. So uh, we had to keep it quiet because we didn't want to raise any red flags. And we also don't want to increase the risk of looking bad in case those conversations went sideways. Mm -hmm. Well, um, sort of following up on that, we have a question uh, asking you, how did you decide and find a third party consultant to support that merger, especially when you're trying to keep this cloak of silence? Um, I would recommend that uh, you go out and ask your networks for third party organizational consultants who are not crazy and who are not incompetent because about 99% of organizational development consultants are absolutely horrible. Uh, and they button they charge you an arm and a leg and your child and so um, really um, look carefully check for references in our case we used a consultant that we had previously used as I said her name's Leslie to Maggie I'm sure she'll be when we did all this work virtually during 2020 with the pandemic so she can probably help you um, you know engage in those conversations wherever in this country but um, she was sane she was smart and she knew how to ground all of us in that conversation. Um, and I think that's a very, that's a rarity in, in the consultant world. Mm -hmm. So no offense to consultants on this call. <laughs> <laughs> One final question uh, for Peggy. In those deep conversations that you had over four months, did you look at situations where you considered passing hands of leadership over to a new artistic leader? Um, and they're saying, I guess I'm wondering when, if there are situations where that is a good option. I think that would potentially be a good option if you were had a like if you were venued and you were serving other artists somehow. I guess, yeah, you could call my dance company an organization. It's just my mind <laughs> and my body and my body of work. That's all it is. It doesn't actually exist. I, I could basically say that. And, and then do you give an organization that has your own name to somebody else? What do they do with that? Um, mm -hmm. So I, that's why from the outset, I knew I'll finish my work someday. I didn't, I couldn't have predicted how that was going to happen, but the moment arrived and I absolutely recognized it. Wonderful. Well, with that, I am going to wrap up uh, and say a, a quick thank you to you all, but I'm also inviting Diane from Working Culture here to do our final wrap up. Thank you so much, Aubrey, uh, and, and thank you. What a fascinating discussion, uh, particularly for, for me. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of Working Culture. Uh, and for those of you who don't know us, um, our mission is to support the professional lives of artists, creatives, and cultural workers, and the organizations that support and engage them through skills development, research, and uh, careers resources. And we are thrilled to have partnered with Business and Arts uh, on this particular panel discussion. Uh, I want to thank again the guest speakers, You're just an amazing group. J.S. Rue, Melissa Tuplin, and Peggy Baker, uh, and our wonderful moderator, uh, Brian Lovner, for guiding us through this challenging topic. All of you have presented some incredibly thought-provoking ideas about life cycles and ways to transform organizational models. Uh, and special thanks to our, our large and engaged audience for contributing uh, our, their questions. I want to once again thank the uh, Power Corporation of uh, Canada's presenting partner for this speaker series in 2022. 
Every month, Business and Arts invites industry leaders from across the business and arts uh, sector to share advice, insights, and best practices. Please visit businessandarts.org to learn more about upcoming speaker series, webinars, and other programs. And you can also follow Business and Arts and Work and Culture on social media for the latest news. Uh, Brian mentioned very early on that, uh, that WIC had recently launched a new fund called the Catalyst and Transformation Fund, which is supported by the City of Toronto, the Metcalf Foundation, and most recently, there'll be more news on our website, the Canada Council. Uh, we owe a huge debt of thanks to the, uh, the CATA uh, program. Um, it's very much modeled on, uh, on their uh, experience. And in fact, I'm going to be tapping into Melissa even more, I think, listening to everything that she, she's going through, because we're sharing very much the same experiences, particularly around uh, the majority of uh, applicants really trying to explore quite innovative strategic partnerships, one or two mergers, one or two wind downs, but, but they're not the majority, certainly. Uh, and the, the, the fund is designed as a capacity building program for creative sector organizations seeking support for substantive restructuring, mergers, structured partnerships, hibernations, and wind downs. Uh, as I said, the details are on our, our website and next week we'll be, we'll be announcing the scope of the Canada Council uh, support, which is, which is very uh, welcomed. Uh, the, um, the purpose is, as, as with the CATA fund, is to really find those new and innovative ways of working in, and to echo everything that was said by the panelists, that this can be a positive step, that this is part of the life cycle of, of organizations. And we have got to, coming out of the pandemic, find new and interesting ways of building, building resiliency into the sector so that we, uh, we are stronger coming out of this. Uh, the link to the fund and, uh, and other resources and articles mentioned in this presentation are available uh, in the chat. I want to again say thank you, everyone. Thank you to our ASL interpreters, too. A lot of work there and quite beautiful. Um, and uh, thank you, Aubrey. It's been a pleasure working with you. And with that, I am uh, have the pleasure of signing off. Uh, and apparently, we just kind of fade into the, uh, into the mist. So thank you again, and uh, I'll, I'll look forward to talking to everybody at another at another time. Thank you.